Hi, I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, and on this episode of the Barbell Medicine Podcast, we're talking with Greg Knuckles about science and training. So I think some of the criticisms are deserved and some of them aren't deserved. So one of the undeserved criticisms, I think, um, is the idea of like, oh, this is just science. It's not the real world. But it's like, where the f*** do you think the labs are located? Like, we don't, we don't go to an alternate dimension to carry out these studies. So, I mean, my, my, my bias there is like, I think a, a lot of that is probably just like dose dependent stuff. Like exercise can definitely have bad effects on people if they do way too much, way too soon. I think that the research gives you a very good starting point. Um, so again, like the, the whole point of inferential statistics is to find what works best or at least like better than the alternative on average. Um, so like, unless I have like a strong reason to believe that someone's just going to be like an outlier in terms of like qualitatively what they'll respond to, um, then I just assume they're kind of average. And so I, I base kind of like my, my initial programming on both like, what does my experience tell me works, but then also like what should work on average based on the literature. All this and much more on this episode of the Barbell Medicine Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast, YouTube channel, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever the heck you're getting this from. I'm here with the second most handsome doctor in North America, Dr. Austin Baraki. And we got a special guest, Greg Knuckles. Uh, So Greg's actually super, super strong. He's got over 500 Wilks. Uh, I think you've squatted well over 800, I think, and benched near five and pulled near eight. I think that's right. That's a 242. Is that right? Uh, Best squat, 765. Well, I, pff, all right. You know what? It's pedestrian. Get this guy out. Of, yeah, get this guy out of here. We need something. Oh man. But but I've, but I've come, yeah. Come on here under false pretenses. I apologize. <laughs> right. <laughs> but obviously, very well trained. You went to Harding University for undergrad. You and I share that. I didn't graduate from there, but I did go. Oh, there. I forgot about that. Cersei, Arkansas, baby. Dude, were, represent. Were, were were you an exercise science major? No, no, I was a. I think a Bible major at the time. I was, uh... <laughs> oh, so so here here's something not many people know about me. Um, so I've put out in the world that I have a degree in exercise science uh, and almost got a degree in history. What a lot of people don't know is that I dual majored in uh, in in one of the Bible majors in exercise science. So I well at Harding yeah. at Harding you take enough courses that really you just need a <laughs> yeah, few you, you extra take, you courses. You take like three extra classes and you have a major. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get that that Bible degree is super helpful, super helpful at rejecting like rhetoric and okay. Uh, it, is, it is so helpful that I've told almost nobody except now you're <laughs> you've in heard it here first. <laughs> this is a barbell medicine exclusive. <laughs> yeah, you, okay, you got so the you scoop. Went, so in addition to being a world-class powerlifter, you have exercise science degree from Harding University. You're getting your master's right now at UNC. So your research, though, is on uh, as far males versus females is recovery rates, which is way more interesting than my thesis. My thesis was on the anatomical uh, prevalence of the vastus medialis obliquus, which uh, let me just I'll cut to the end. It doesn't exist. But... Yours is actually is worth discussing. So I, what is, I didn't I didn't realize that was you. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, dude, you know, that's so exercise, cool. Yeah, well, in the exercise science literature, people are like, "Oh, you're related to Avery Fagenbaum." And I'm like, "No, we spell our names differently. <laughs> we just we both have unfortunate last names. Let it go." <laughs> um, uh, Greg, Greg, and I we have a history. We go back to either late 2013 <laughs> or early 2014. Well, so here's how this here's how this goes. And I'll, I'll give people a little background and I'll let you talk about all the cool stuff that you've done. Uh, so it must have been, yeah, it was either late 2013, early 2014. You know, Greg had been saying publicly that, hey, it didn't really matter if you squatted high bar or low bar, you know, for different, uh, 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 you know, to get more motor units active, to use more muscle mass to squat. That's, you know, these sort of tenants from a, another organization that shall not be named at this time. And, you know, we were, or I was, you know, called upon, you go, go get them, 
go get them. And Greg actually, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> what's interesting is somebody had posted something about this on that forum, and Greg comes from the ether of the internet and finds that people were talking about him and says, hey, guys, I'm here to answer any questions. Yeah, interesting. You know, it's very nice. Uh, and then we're just assholes. So, <laughs> I, well, be, be, you know, it's because it challenged it challenged our understanding of things that we actually didn't understand as well as we do now. And all, not a, not only it challenged our understanding, but then sort of our, our persona, our, our identity with, you know, things we and our social circle. Like we I, were with all these different groups of people who were we all the same belief system. So if we defected and said, yeah, Greg's probably right. You know, that would have been that would have been bad news for us. So I, I, I wanted to apologize. And I, do you remember anything about that exchange that's, that stands out to you? Just like, I, I mean, o- only very vaguely. And like, to be fair to you guys, like I was God, I was like a 21 year old kid who had like just taken my first round of physics classes. And I was like, haha, I understand kinetics now. And I think these guys are fucking <laughs> it up. Um, so I was like probably also like way more abrasive than I should have been. Um, but yeah, so, so I can't, I can't say I remember any details, but I remember coming away from it, uh, specifically you, Jordan, being like, man, that guy's an asshole. Um, (laughs) he got it, he got uh, it, he got it, good. But yeah, so, um, that was a long time ago, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember any details. Like, so actually looking back at that in some of the earlier things that I said about squatting, um... I think in hindsight, I think I was right, but for the wrong reasons. Um, sure. So I think like some of the art or the arguments I was putting forth back then, like the arguments themselves were incorrect. Um, so yeah, like there was definitely reason for people to disagree with me. Um, but yeah, water under just, the bridge. Ch- it is what it is. Ch- just not, just not our our rationale. I mean, again, at the time we held this idea that if you only by squatting low bar, the refining power of the low bar back squat could one hope to achieve maximum muscular strength and hypertrophy development, you know, secondary to the unique features of low bar squat, which I think that everyone on this call would now challenge, you know, vehemently outside of, do you want to get better at low bar squatting? If so, you should low bar squat to help your low bar squat. Although other squat variations that are similar are likely to have carryover as well. You know, that just, that did not, did not compute when we initially engaged, you know, and then it was like, it, it, yeah, it got, it got, uh, heated, but for unnecessary reasons. Again, now I wish I could have gone back and done things a little differently. Um, and especially Same. just, yeah, yeah. Especially just because if, if, if we, Austin, and, and if we would have gone through that, like sort of, hmm, we might be wrong about this and then investigated further, you know, with a more, with, an, an open mind and we did that if we did that in 2013 or 2014 where would we be now <laughs> this is i mean that's uh, a, I that's know. that's the topic that i have written about a little bit in terms of uh you know just when you don't know what you don't know uh you're like completely unaware of the, the existence of all these other concepts and and that's kind of where you know uh research and and scientific in, inquiry and stuff like that can help us kind of uncover reveal some of those things that might contradict our, our expectations or our, you know, existing hypotheses about things. And, uh, you know, that's, I think what has led Greg along, along his path, uh, so far. Um, and so <clears throat> one of the topics we wanted to talk about was knowing your involvement in kind of, you know, exercise science, sports science research, the, the stuff that you guys do at, um, mass, uh, you know, you guys are fairly well recognized at this point for, for the work you do in terms of, uh, looking at the scientific literature and trying to translate it uh, and, and apply it to the kind of lay public and athletes and, and competitors and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, and we, and we try to do a lot of the same thing, but there's a lot of criticism uh, when it comes to actually trying to utilize scientific research for these purposes. Um, what has been your experience in kind of dealing with some of those criticisms? How, how, how have you, um, kind of fielded those criticisms about the use and application of science. So I think some of the criticisms are deserved and some of them aren't deserved. So one of the undeserved criticisms, I think, um, is the idea of like, oh, this is just science. It's not the real world. But it's like, where the f*** do you think the labs are located? Like, we don't we don't go to an alternate dimension to carry out these studies. Like, they're real humans lifting weights. Um, 
So like, yeah. So if if it's a study with like a really just bizarre training protocol that no one would ever do, like yeah, sure, whatever. But if it's just that you don't like the results of a study and be like, oh, this isn't like real world training, it's like no, like it did take place under lab conditions, but it it took place like in this physical reality. Like I don't know. I think that's a dumb criticism. Um, but I also think that <clears throat> like quote unquote, like evidence based fitness people also invite a lot of crit- criticism um, from just like not not really understanding what they're doing and what they're reading in the first place. Um, so like, f- for example, if there's a study on any topic, doesn't really matter what it is. And it says that like, on average, like thing A produces more larger strength gains or more hypertrophy or whatever than thing B. Um, then like a lot of people interpret that to mean like that is necessarily the best thing or, or A is necessarily better than B for everyone in all contexts, um, which is just like it's an intellectually bankrupt position because like first, if, if they understood if they understood the fucking statistical models they were working with, like it's called inferential statistics because you're trying to infer from the, the population in the study to the broader population that the study population is representative of. So if that study population is, you know, 18 to 25 year old college age males, like that is all you can make those direct inferences about. Um, If you make inferences about like two other groups or about other populations, like, you know, you you could still count it as weak evidence, but you shouldn't necessarily assume that it's going to to port directly. Um, But then also like the statistical tests you're using, all they're doing is comparing means. Um, It's not necessarily saying that thing A is better than thing B for all individuals, even within the the single population you're working with. Just means that mean A is is larger than mean B, given some level of confidence. Um, So like, yeah. yeah. So well, it's that's just an interesting thing though to think about because again, like five years ago, if you would have asked me about the inter individual differences and responses to a given training intervention. I would have been, I would have looked at you like doe eyed, like what, you know, mm-hmm. like what people respond oh, yeah. differently to different things, you know? And then, and then you thought you like rolled around, you're like, eh, kind of, but, but I remember the first time I read that, like, like, and it wasn't even a scientific paper. It was, uh, uh, Stephen Magnus's book, science mm-hmm. of running. He talks about just, you know, this huge variability of response to different, uh, endurance training protocols based on, you know, uh, and then goes through evidence and I go. I wonder if this like exists in like strength training or if just everyone responds <laughs> yeah. exactly the same all the time. And then I was like, oh, you idiot. Gosh, you know, well, and it's, and just, it's, but, it's, an, it's not even just like the, the variability and like how large the responses are, but even also what people respond well to. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. So like, so like for that, you need crossover studies, which like no one ever does because they take twice as long. Um, and that, that doesn't look good for, for uh, buffing up a CV, but yeah, like, in, in a bunch of crossover studies, like, uh, if they would have just done, like, thing A versus thing B in a given population, thing A may look better. But then if they do a crossover study, you find that, like, oh, thing B, which is on average inferior, may have been the better option for, like, a non-negligible amount of people, like 20-30% of the population. Um, so, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the most provocative thing that Greg has posted, uh, or ta- at least I had heard... I, somebody sent a link, so you know how the internet goes. Like somebody says something, and then five links later, you're like, "Oh, what the?" You know, I can't believe this guy posted that. If, but it if, was uh, if, if it was provocative, I probably regret it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, so the the post was about you know a uh, non a certain non zero percentage of people who, when exposed to exercise, will have worse outcomes in like blood pressure and oh, yeah. their lipid panel and you know and and diabetes outcomes etc and i remember reading the source paper and being like angry i'm like not angry at like the <laughs> results but just angry at myself for because you know it, uh, one of the things we always try to figure out for any intervention is the number needed to treat and then subsequently the number needed to harm you know and so it, with exercise i always assumed that the number needed to treat was one and <laughs> yeah. the number needed to a thousand was infinity and, you know so like so you couldn't ha- possibly harm somebody outside of an a, you know an injury potentially mm-hmm. uh and but you could help everyone if you just got them active and then i'm reading this stuff and it, that the 
they're getting their information from the heritage study and uh, uh, I think the lift more study was in there too and it's and uh, one other large scale like exercise intervention um, and it, anyway so and I remember reading it and I go and knuckles at it again just you know <laughs> just, just, just yeah just, so, so but, I mean my, but, my my bias there is like I think a, a lot of that is probably just like dose dependent stuff. Like, exercise can definitely have bad effects on people if they do way too much way too soon. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, like, with with an individually tailored exercise intervention, number needed to treat is one and number needed to harm is infinity. But, yeah, for, for just, like, a, a general exercise prescription as is used in those studies, like, yeah, there's there's huge variability and it may actually be bad for some people. Whoa, mind's blown all over the Internet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, I mean, as we're talking about these criticisms uh, and then also the limitations of science and strength conditioning practice, you know, I, I think a big something you will hear, you know, outside of the real world uh, comment, but sort of an extension of that is like, yeah, well, these people aren't like they're not lifters. They're mm-hmm. not, you know, trained power lifters. And then it's like, uh, all right, have you read any of the stuff from the Norwegian power, you know, Nor- the Norwegian powerlifting team when they study them? Have you read any, you know, or did you even read the methods when it says, oh, these people on average had a, uh, you know, a very well-trained back squat when you they, you look at the methodology? So, so uh, what's it? Uh, uh, Kramer's re- most recent paper, I think, had people with an average back squat near 600 pounds, and he starts talking about uh, split squats and their that effect on back squat strength. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. these people were not untrained, and 600 pounds is not an insignificant number anyway, you know. Yeah. And so it's so so one of the I, I'm curious to see how you would respond to criticisms about. Yeah, well, these are all just college age, you know, exercise science students trying to get extra credit. None of them are like trained lifters or, or you know, strength power athletes to begin with. How would you respond to that? Um, two responses. So first response is that um, I think some people are just elitist assholes. And, you know, so, so a study may have like a required training age of like two or three years. Um And then they look at it and it's like, oh, these guys are only squatting like 380 and benching 240 or something like these guys are so weak. But it's like, just look, just look around the gym, man. Like, like I get it. Like you you have a 600 pound deadlift and a one inch dick. Like you're super cool. But like not all not all humans can be as cool as you, bro. And so so like I, I think I think people almost just use that as a way to like talk down to folks and just use it as an opportunity to point out like, oh, I'm stronger than the people in this study. Therefore I'm special and physiology doesn't apply to me. Um, so like, and, and sometimes I think that's valid. Like there are some studies you, you open up and it's like, oh, we have like trained 20 year old men and you look at the bench press and it's like 140, and it's like, okay, like these guys are untrained. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think a lot of people are, are either just like overestimating how strong the average person is or just want it as, like to use it as a chance to stroke their own ego. So I think it's it's not unreasonable to think that trained and untrained people may um, have like different responses to different types of studies or like different types of interventions. But I think like more often than not, we found that trained and untrained people mostly differ in in the magnitude of their response and not necessarily like what they actually respond to. Um, so like, for example, when when some of the studies on like low load training, like thirty percent one rep max training and hypertrophy came out, um, some studies on untrained people, they found that like oh if if you take the sets to failure, people grow similarly training at thirty percent and eighty percent of your max, and everyone jumped on that and it's like ah it's because they were untrained like no way in hell that like a trained lifter would actually be able to grow with that low of a weight, um, and then like they started doing studies in trained people and there's like three or four studies now finding oh, they actually have responses very similar to untrained people. Like, they don't grow quite as much, but the overall, like, contours are similar. Like, similar growth between, like, high load and low load training. Um, And so, like, yeah, I I mean, I think that that the amount of progress you can expect in a trained lifter is obviously way less. But I think in terms of trying to... I think in terms of, like, looking at the science, if there's, like, you know one study on like elite athletes and four studies on like somewhat trained people and like six studies on untrained people. Like, 
yeah, sure, put more weight on the one study on elite athletes. But, like, don't discount the studies on untrained people. And I think more often than not, if it's a big enough body of literature, you find that um, the the untrained lifters kind of respond to to stuff the same way that more trained people do, just to a much greater magnitude. Yeah, that's yeah. that's something that, you know, we've had some conversations with folks about this, and, and it comes down to the argument that, like, physiology doesn't suddenly switch when you become some arbitrary level of strength. The, the physiologic mm-hmm. kind of responses are going to be, you know, generally the same. And when you have an unexpected result, uh, kind of like what you described with the, uh, the findings of low load training in, in quote-unquote trained individuals – then it should actually make you question your prior premise and under or understanding of like the mechanisms of hypertrophy. If you were previously under the impression that, Mm -hmm. you know, higher load always is going to beat lower load because load itself is the determining factor versus other factors that had yet to be kind of elucidated at the Mm -hmm. time. And then they go back and they're like, oh, you can get equivalent hypertrophy across a huge load of uh, acute, a huge range of, of, uh, of loading ranges. And we come to a, to a better, you know, more informed understanding as yeah. a result more yeah more complete i mean yeah. I, I i i do think um i do think there are some some very basic physiological things that change like that, that differ between like completely untrained people and people who have been training for like 10 years but i think that like the physiology sure. between someone who's been training for like one year and 10 years is really not all that different yeah yeah i would agree just for the folks at home who are like shaking their head right now shaking their heads about this load sort of hypertrophy thing we're talking about. The, the premise is that if you use 30% of your 1RM or something, a low load, okay, and you take that set to failure, that the act of taking that set to failure or near failure will involve greater and greater motor unit recruitments that approximates that of a heavier load and that you can get equivalent hypertrophy responses from using the different loading protocols. Uh, and so then people say, yeah, well, well, what about strength? It's like, well, we're not talking about strength performance. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're, we're talking about hypertrophy. And so if we're strictly just r- limiting the discussion to muscular cross-sectional area, all right, then you can make an argument for a lighter load training. And then there are some uh, both intrinsic and extrinsic factors that go into total fatigue management that you might want to use lighter load training at different points, you know? So anyway, it's just for the people at home who are like, I'm not familiar with this argument, but the argument originally was that 30% or 40% of your one RM couldn't possibly, you know, drive muscular hypertrophy adaptations to the similar level as higher load training. And in fact, I believe there may be a YouTube video floating around of Dr. Baraki discussing you were on a panel. I don't know if you remember this, Austin. Yeah, that conference. was uh, that was uh, unfortunate. Oh yeah, about the about the Mor- <laughs> about the Morton paper. Yeah, yeah. I, forget, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I think I think my uh, my contribution to it was strictly looking at some of the the methods and um, yeah that that whole that whole scene was yeah pretty unfortunate. I will not be linking that in the description below. We're hoping that this gets purged from the internet. There's like a cleanse, well, a palate cleanse. I think, I think, I think we, we uh, definitely understand that the internet is forever, like certain other things. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So, yeah. But it's just, it, you know, I mean, that was probably four years ago. And, and again, having better, again, more knowledge gives you more complete pictures to understand these things. Because at the time, our understanding did not allow for that to be true. And now, Man, as, as as I was making that statement, I remember that Austin was on that panel, and I was like, "Oh shit, is this podcast about to take a hard left turn?" <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, there's a lot of stuff regret that I would regret, you know, saying, given my current understanding. But that's also like this evolution of learning and evolution of like knowledge acquisition that goes on over time, and I think that's perfectly normal. You know, the the thing that's abnormal would be. Two, two situations. Situation one, if you already know everything up front, you're just like, I'm a savant, like I know all things, you know, like that yeah. doesn't happen, right? And then, and then also rejecting the acquisition of new knowledge uh, that doesn't fit whatever arbitrary model that you have to start out with. If you do that, you're really, really going to limit your growth uh, as a professional in any sort of field, you know? So I think the normal process is that you start out young Padawan, you have some ideas, and then you learn more and more things. It doesn't mean you can immediately accept them all, right? Like right off the bat, because there's too much cognitive dissonance. But at some point, <laughs> you get to say, oh, well, now this fits because you you have evolved so much over time. And, um, and I think there's a general 
loosening of, of how strongly you hold on to your conclusions to the point where at this point, I don't really give a shit if something, if I say something that ends up being wrong, whereas, you know, like we said yeah. before, it was different. So I'm okay I, with being I, uncomfortable I think, there. I think just like a good, uh, like philosophy of science education helps people generally think better as well. So, so like two of, two of like the foundational things in science, or at least like post popper, um, is the idea of falsifiability. So like the, if you really want to believe something, you need to go out of your way to try to disprove it as, as strongly as you can. And then if, and then if you, you know, put, put it through the ringer, like whatever idea it is, if it comes out on the other side unscathed, like, yeah, then it, then it warrants being very confident in that. Um, but the idea is less like, oh, I have these beliefs. Now what supports them? It's more like, I have these beliefs, like, let's see if I can just utterly wreck them. And if I can't, then okay, maybe I'm onto something. Um, and then the other thing is just assuming the null. Um, so, so more like when you're confronted with a new idea, um, you just start with, basically just start with the idea that it's bullshit and have to disprove it being bullshit. Like, I think, I think that both of those are very useful ways to approach new ideas. It's really interesting. The first thing you mentioned there, because as you're saying it, I realized that like, oh, yeah, I do this every single day in clinical practice. Like when I'm like in the hospital, I'm a patient and I want to give them some diagnosis and I'm sitting there like, let me do everything I can to convince myself it's not a bunch of other shit. Um, mm -hmm. And once I can finally do that, I'm like, oh, yeah, I think this is heart failure. Or yeah, I think this is whatever is whatever is, uh, you know, my final diagnosis is. So it is definitely a super useful approach to uh, to determining things. Yeah. And then it, it's I don't know if you remember the infographic that you posted on your story, Austin, you were in a heated rage last week, I believe. <laughs> and it was like and it was like, if you have a belief, then and you want to engage in intelligent discussion about this then you have to agree to certain premises. And one of the premises is that if, you know, certain parts or, or of your argument or of your belief system are proven to be factually incorrect, you know, then you must reject at least part of your belief system, you know, and if you're unwilling to do that, then you can't really engage in this discussion, you know, because you're unwilling to like sure. even be yeah. open to new, new information, sure. which I think it's, uh, has to go with this evolution of learning, which dovetails nicely into this role and application of science and strength and conditioning practice. I think, you know, my, my overarching theme is, is uh, or overarching idea is that if you are not open to using science in your, you know, in your practice as a coach, um, uh, or your personal, your personal, uh, personal, uh, ex you know, training, then maybe, maybe you can't, uh, say scientific things. Like, <laughs> like, like, well, it's cause so, so for instance, you know, if you're, if you're unwilling to you let you like read all, all of the literature or a good, a substantial portion of the literature, uh, which would inform you of other things, then you can't say, use stuff like motor unit recruitment and you can't use stuff like, like, because you, you at, that, at that point you're accepting only part of science and not the whole of it. Do you see what I'm saying? Like you, you can't say, well, science is good when it supports my belief system, but this other science, which seems at face value to be, you know, equivalently done, you, you, you can't use that. Like you, you can use, you can accept yeah. all of science and whatever it spits out, or you can accept none of it and just make stuff up as you go. And I think some people choose the latter, which is uh, unfortunate for them and their audiences. What, one of the things that, that I try to do is um, like, if, if I come across a paper like on PubMed or like someone posts on Facebook and I see it as I'm scrolling, um, is like, I'll read the title. And then, so most titles are super boring. It's like the effects of X on Y. Um, like sometimes it's a declarative statement, like whatever, like high load training is better for strength gains. Then like whatever, like they gave the game away. But generally it's like the effects of X on Y. Um, and so what I'll do is like, I'll read the title. And if I'm like, oh, this is an interesting topic then without reading the abstract to like not know what the results are, I'll pull the paper up and read the methods. And if the methods look good, then I'm like, oh, this is probably a legit paper and whatever the results are, are probably good. And if the methods are terrible, um, then I'm like, oh, this is probably some garbage. Um, and then like, and then like go, go into it with biased based off of like the quality of the methodology before I know what the results are. And then there's sometimes um, it's like I reviewed a paper from Mass this last month about um, 
sex differences in recovery. And, um, like I did that and in my bias is that women recover a little bit quicker than men. That's like one, one of the things I'm looking at for my thesis. Um, and I read the methods and I was like, Oh, these are, these are solid methods. And then I started reading the results and I was like, God damn it. Like, <laughs> because like the men recovered quicker and I'm like, well, now I'm going to have to, to rewrite a significant portion of my literature search or of uh, my lit review. Um, but yeah, so some, it, I find that, I find that that's like a better kind of bias to have, like bias it based off of what you think the strength of the evidence is based off the methodology rather than know what the results are. And then like your, your evaluation of the methods be biased because you like, or don't like the results. Yeah. Well, that happens in medicine all the time, Austin, you know, it's like the grading of certain evidence, you know, like when you read these position stands and these new guidelines, they, they grade, you know, how good the evidence is to answer this particular clinical question. Even if it is answerable, they're like, this is grade three. And you're like, okay. Or it's like, you know, or sometimes they use alpha, uh, alphabet and they're like grade E and it's like just a group of old white dudes in a room saying, yeah, I don't know. This is what we've always done. So <laughs> carry on. But, but that doesn't exist in strength conditioning. Like, have you noticed, I mean, in medicine, in literally every field, like every specialty, there are guidelines, there are position stands, there are, you know, all of these materials put out to help clinicians in practice. The only guidelines I am aware of in strength conditioning are like the ACSM, you know, guidelines for physical activity that were recently updated, but there's no strength of the evidence cited in their full guide, you know, hundred and something page guideline report. It just, you know, Hey, here's what we found, but no, like they don't grade the evidence. They don't like provide you with context other than, yeah, it's strong evidence. It's like, well, strong, comp you know, compared to what most, most of the metas do. Um, so like there, there's typically a, a section in most, at least like well done meta analyses where they, um, like grade out all of the studies that made the inclusion or that met the inclusion sure. criteria. But yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think there's any just like general guidelines that do that. No. No. Well, I was just, I mean, trying to answer simple questions like the effect of hydration on human performance, for instance, like under various contexts, there's this guy, Stuky, and I just, only reason I know this is because I was really far down the rabbit hole. Anyway, this guy, he pulled literally all studies looking at water intake and acute performance in mm -hmm. any sort of physical task. It was 164 uh, uh, randomized controlled trials where they had you know, different wa levels of water intake. And he detailed every single one, like, you know, and here's why this was a good paper or a bad paper, a good paper, bad paper. And I remember walking after reading this monster or an article, I was like, this guy literally read everything there is to know about this one particular subject. And at the end, he had to write what he read. He goes, eh, I'm not so sure it matters other than ad libitum intake is probably best. <laughs> like, how yeah. upsetting, how upsetting at the end. You're like, oh man, I just spent all this time. Um, so, so when you're using literature to actually make coaching decisions, Greg, like how, how do you go about doing that? I mean, you, you program for people, right? You're still doing coaching. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're like writing a program, are you like searching people's demographic data in PubMed and like trying to pull up the perfect <laughs> program for them? Or how are you, how are you using the scientific literature to help you program for folks or coach folks? Uh, kind of at two spots in the process. So one, I think that, um, I think that the research gives you a very good starting point. Um, so again, like the, the whole point of inferential statistics is to find what works best or at least like better than the alternative on average. Um, so like, unless I have like a strong reason to believe that someone's just going to be like an outlier in terms of like qualitatively what they'll respond to, um, then I just assume they're kind of average. And so I, I base kind of like my, my initial programming on both like, what does my experience tell me works, but then also like what should work on average based on the literature. Um, but then like that typically works like, okay, to start with and, and we keep troubleshooting from there. Um, and the other, the other spot where I use science in the process is like in troubleshooting, kind of determining what direction I'm going to troubleshoot in. So like, let's say someone's bench press isn't going up. There are an infinite number of ways that you could change someone's bench training. 
Um, so like you need to narrow it down to like, what are some, some ways that are likely going to be better for getting their bench moving again? So I think if something has scientific evidence to support it, then, you know, it's, it's probably going to be a better troubleshooting option than just some other random idea I made up out of thin air. Um, so yeah, and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, Austin, um, do you do anything? Do you do, do anything? Do you do anything different as far as using evidence on, for programming? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that one of the areas of interest for me, from a like a cognitive psychology standpoint, is confirmation bias in general because it's so prevalent everywhere. And so, if I think that there's something that uh, that probably works, but it's based on kind of uncontrolled observation or uncontrolled observations of other people in the field. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have similar observations myself, but then if I see large scale evidence that shows that it's no better than something else that might ultimately influence my decision. If it's like, Oh, maybe I was just seeing what I wanted to see all along and maybe it doesn't work as well as I thought. And I can maybe try something else. I think that's the other piece of this is making sure that I'm not getting caught up with, with some of this kind of, uh, these, these cognitive biases that can really trap all of us. Um, when we're trying to observe training response in an individual and we have certain biases as to how we all like to program or interventions we like to use. And, uh, you know, we, it's easy for us to dismiss when it doesn't work too well or to latch onto it when it works really well. And maybe it's like, oh, this person's just a freak hyper responder and they're going to respond to whatever I threw at them um, versus mm -hmm. letting it kind of confirm my bias of like, oh, this method is the way to make someone's bench go up or something like that. So I think that's the other the other side of things is using it to uh, using it to control for for our own kind of uncontrolled biased observations in practice. Yeah. I assume you go to Instagram first. Like that's the <laughs> initial search is like bench, bench, not responding. What do, and then you, you know, you find out. Yeah. yeah. That's a, well, that's a similar thing that, that I end up using. And I, but I think I use, end up using it more indirectly to be honest, like, because we're constantly consuming stuff and sharing papers and stuff like that. So you end up, you end up amassing these sort of general ideas about what are modifiable factors in someone's training that, are likely to have an effect, just like Greg alluded to earlier. So you're thinking volume, you're thinking average intensity, you're thinking frequency, you know, and then there's some studies, you know, investigating different variations and their outcomes. And so if you're not seeing a particular intervention with any sort of, you know, robust or well, well controlled uh, or well done studies investigating them, I don't know if I use them very often. Like, I don't think I've ever programmed like a BOSU ball bench press for someone wanting to get their bench press up because <laughs> I've seen, well, cause you've seen literature suggesting this doesn't, that doesn't work. Right. Yeah. And then, it, it, you know, versus when you talk about frequency of bench press training, you're like, well, I have seen, you know, decent amount of evidence suggesting that higher frequency, you know, may have some benefit in, you know, particular context. And so then you're like, hmm, well, instead of doing the BOSU ball bench or the Spoto press, because this is very, you know, that that's on the gram, then you say, well, maybe, uh, maybe we adjust, uh, adjust frequency first or total volume or average intensity, stuff like that versus, you know, again, stuff that you don't see, say literature on. So that's, that's how I use it. Ind it's indirect though. It's not like I like somebody has a check in and like my bench press is not going up and I'm like to the PubMed, I must, I must go yeah, immediately. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, I think just like kind of personal subjective feedback is, is valuable as well. So like if I, if I read a paper and I read something that surprises me, um, typically like whatever the idea is, like I'll try it out on myself first. And I know that like my subjective experience doesn't generalize to everyone else, but like if, if, if I try something and I'm like, there's no way in hell this is going to work for a lot of people, um, then like that's going to be kind of lower on on my troubleshooting list of like maybe this is something to try. Um, but if I try it and it works really well, then I'm like, oh, so you know we have science. Uh, my own subjective experience also kind of confirms this. So now like maybe let's try it with other people. Um, one of the big ones was um, just using like a lot of different variations instead of making programming like hyper specific all the time. Cause I was like big time in the hyper specificity camp for a while. Um, and, and then I came across a paper called if memory serves, uh, variations in exercise are, are more effective than in loading schemes at promoting strength gains or something like that. Um, where it was looking at strength gains in the squat. And so one group was just squatting or two groups were just squatting 
and then one and then two groups were squatting but also doing other lower body exercises and then two of the groups were just training with eight rep max loads i believe um either eight or ten and then two of the groups were training with like a variety of loads so like i think four rep max eight rep max and 12 rep max um Uh, the fonseca Fonseca paper yeah 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 fonseca 2014 um and so the the two groups with um the the variations in exercise tended to to gain more on their squat than the two groups that just squatted um which like very strongly surprised me at the time like the two group the two other groups like they were still squatting it just wasn't the only thing they were doing for their lower body so i was like this doesn't match my biases let's try it um so i started doing like a lot more variations in my training and it like my squat responded really well to it um so i was like oh okay so now we have some scientific evidence like i've seen it work for myself so now let's maybe like push it out to other people so that's that's kind of the process that i use so whenever i actually come across a paper that doesn't fit my bias i uh, send it to austin and hopefully he tells me that it's okay and that i'm gonna be okay (laughs) sometimes he does it he says well i guess this changes everything and then (laughs) and then we go dark for a month uh uh, actually no this paper actually ties into something i want to talk about which was this beginner like programming consideration so kind of hop around here Mm -hmm. so the idea is we're trying to make yeah, Austin wrote this, you know, we're trying to make resistance training broadly accessible from a public health perspective. And, and so what are the considerations you think are most important to getting people started? You know, because it, that hyper specificity and like only doing a handful of exercise variations, only doing one rep range, you know, fives only, for instance, only, you know, four or five exercises. That's a, that, that's that's, a, that's that, a random number pulled out of thin air, right? Well, sure. It's well, everything's arbitrary, right? Like the size of the weights are arbitrary. The movement confines are arbitrary. You know, it's all yeah, it's all yeah. just somebody made it up and gave it made it important by creating a sport around it. But what do you? Th- what are the main considerations you think to getting people started in training? Man, so I think there are are three primary things, and then one little bit down the road. So I think the three prim- primary things are. Um, accessibility so primarily cost there um like ease of doing it um so i think a lot of people who like aren't into lifting or really any sort of like fitness related activities like for us like going to the gym is is no big deal like that's just a part of our lives but like you know if someone has to drive 20 minutes to the gym and they're not already into lifting like that's that's a significant barrier for them um so like i think ideally at least to start with something that someone could do in home would be great. Um, and then also, um, not for everyone, but for, for most people having some sort of like social support system. Um, so I know there, there's research on successful, like people who are successful losing weight. Um, and, and and I think also starting exercise regimens as well. And one of the predictors of success is like, do you have someone to do, to do it with you? Um, so like, you know, you and someone else are both trying to lose 30 pounds. You start, like you, you hop in together. Um, you're, you're going to be more likely to succeed than just trying to fly solo. Um, and I think the same thing applies with, uh, developing like a, an exercise habit as well. So I think those are the three main things. Um, and then a couple months down the line, are you actually getting results? Um, but I think, I think those other three things are, are the primary things just for, for getting someone's foot in the door. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, especially from a population level, you know, like how the eliminating barriers to get people to go to the gym and then, you know, making sure that they're compliant with it. You know, how do you leverage that maximally? And then and I think the methodology second to those things is, you know, that's just a secondary concern. Right. So if someone was like, hey, man, I don't want to do the low bar back squat. I just, you know, I would say. I, I mean, I don't care. Okay, well, like, just put the bar up higher on your back. I don't expect that to make a significant difference in your training outcomes mm-hmm. just in and of itself, right? Similarly, if somebody was like, hey, man, fives for me, that number's bad. My mom died on the 5th of May in 1955, like five, I just can't. And I'm like, well, then you can do fours or sixes. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, what yeah. I'm getting at is that at, at, at a population level, that granularity, that doesn't matter. Right. And then only when you're starting to consider 
different performance outcomes, uh, you know, like strength performance or hypertrophy uh, or, you know, a conditioning performance or something like that, do the specifics of the program start to matter much, much more. But if you are not going to be performing, right, if it's just that I'm doing this so I can live a full and complete life, then you have a much broader range of things that you can include in your training program that you'll likely see benefit from. You don't need to be hyper specific. You don't, it, you shouldn't be. I mean, what, unless that's going to maximize your compliance, unless it's going to max, you know, low, lim, uh, yeah, uh, lower, yeah. lower the barriers to entry. But I think that restricts people almost. They're like, I can't do any cardio because I've been told that if I do that, that my strength on this arbitrary exercise for this arbitrary number of reps is not going to be developed as quickly. And it's like, mm -hmm. I don't care what happens at three months, really, as long as you're still exercising. That's the main thing I care about at three months. Yeah, I care yeah. what what's happened at three years, six years, 10 years, you know, man, I, I get, I, I get tagged in threads all the time on our fitness on Reddit. Um, oh, Jesus. And <laughs> like my first, my first question to, to people asking advice for their training is like, what's your goal? And if someone's like, you know, I, I want to have a 500 Wilkes, then it's like, all right. So, <laughs> try, so try again. now, yeah. So, so, so like one, hope you picked some good parents and two, now let's look at some, some detail oriented stuff. But a lot of people are like, man, I just want to be healthy. And it's like, just lift some weights, man. How? In whatever way you enjoy lifting. Yeah. Just make sure like you're hitting all major muscle groups at least once a week uh, and don't get hurt. Like, you know, that's that's yeah. pretty much all there is to it. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing Austin and I were putting together. You know, we've talked about this like beginner program and like what are the tenets of even designing, like starting to design a beginner program. And the thought was, well, yeah, you want to hit all major muscle groups. You don't want it to be hyper specific because we know that with increased variation up to a certain point, you're likely to experience improvements in motor learning anyway, just because you mm -hmm. get exposed to slight different variations, right? And that's going to improve your performance at different tasks rather than just doing one thing over and over and over again. You'd want multiple different rep ranges to generate the particular responses that, you know, go hand in hand with those different rep ranges. And you would want load management to be such that you had a very low risk of injury. So you'd want the progression to, to be manageable over time. In fact, it wouldn't even be really a beginner program as much as it would be a sort of matrix where you would start here and then be able to like choose, even, choose your own modify, adventure. <laughs> if, choose, yeah, yeah. Choose your own adventure. Modify, evolve, adapt the, 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 the tenants that you're developing mm -hmm. over time to whatever, if you do to happen to decide on a goal, you're like, actually, I just want to get jacked. And you're like, all right, well, here's what we know about getting jacked. And here's how you would adapt it to your, you choose your own adventure. You're choosing your story. Mm -hmm. So you get to tailor it. It's, it is interesting that I didn't hear you say that you should only train three days a week or that you should only pick four or five exercises or just do fives. It's, it's curious that you left that out. I thought those were going to be your top three. Man, I'm not going to lie. The, the people that I that I tend to see in the gym um, who, like, just start and then are, are still there a couple years later, um, more often than not, like, it's people who go in with just, like, kind of a dumb training program that they enjoy doing with their bros. Uh, <laughs> and then they just, like, like lifting and they, like, spending time with their bros. And then over time, they actually learn how to train better. And, you know, a couple years later, they're in a pretty good place, even though they started in kind of a stupid place. Um, whereas like, I, I see a lot of people who, you know, like you've never put a bar on your back and you're already obsessing about like tiny little minute details. Like those people burn out. Like I, I've maybe seen like five of those people actually succeed and still be at it two years later. Yeah. The one thing that you posted about, and Austin, I'll ask you to comment on this first. It, it, it was a while ago, so I just, I wish I had the direct quote, but the fact that the people that you see at the highest levels of strength or highest levels of performance have been almost selected for because they do respond fairly well to whatever the thing is they've been doing for a long period of time, because if mm -hmm. they didn't, they would not, they would not persist. So it's like the people that you see who've been training for 10 years are probably over responders to ex you know, they respond well 
Other, yeah, because yeah. if they didn't respond very well, they'd say, I'm doing something else, man. This is terrible. Like I, I'm literally trying to grind out, you know, for small, small improvements. Whereas, you know, people like us, we're like, yeah, dude, lifting weights is that's the bee's knees. It's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I think that's when I was talking about non-responders. Um, Cause there are a lot of people that just legitimately don't think non-responders to resistance training exist. Um, and like, I don't think they exist in in the same, like, to the same degree as, like, the literature would indicate. Because, like, research that shows, like, oh, there's 20% of non-responders to, to, like, in this study. Like, that's 20% of people who didn't respond to that particular program. Like, that doesn't mean they don't respond to resistance training in general. But, like, yeah, like, there are some people who just really don't get that much out of lifting. And then there are people who are super skeptical that folks like that exist. It's like, ah, they're just not trying hard enough. Like when I lift weights, I get stronger and I build muscle. And it's like, yeah, but like, and, and and like when I go to the gym, like it looks like a lot of these people around me have gotten stronger and built muscle at some point. But it's like, yeah, you don't see the people who don't respond well to lifting because like they try it for three months, nothing happens and they stop. Like people aren't, people aren't going to stick with something for 20 years that they get literally nothing out of. So like, of course you never see those people. I think part of that too is if if they are introduced to it kind of in a way that we were previously describing that's maybe unnecessarily hyper specific or like overly rigid or something like that to the point where yeah you have this group of non-responders that might respond better to either a higher dose or a different formulation of training so to speak and if you give them mm-hmm. permission to try that you know to to do more or to do different uh, maybe they find something that actually ultimately works a little better for them and can improve that long-term compliance to where they're not like man fuck this I'm out you know yeah, for sure. And, and I think um, I think one thing that can improve a lot as well is like the messaging of, of training programs for beginners, because like, as far as I'm aware, most of the people who are like selling programs to beginners are like, this is the best program for new lifters, mm-hmm. um, which I think is, is pernicious messaging, because like, sure, it, it's probably great marketing. It helps you sell, helps you sell product. But then like, it, bio, yeah, yeah. But, but like, you know, if, if, if you're like selling this to someone who's like 30 year 30 years old, they know about the world, like they're probably not going to get sucked in super hard. They read the best program as a generally effective program that I should maybe <laughs> sure. try. But like, one would if it's like, yeah. but if, if it's like some impressionable 16 year old kid, they may think like, oh, this guy's an expert. This is the best program. They try it. It doesn't work great for him. And then they're like, well, if the best thing didn't work for me, I guess I'm screwed. Yeah. Um. I which, must be. Which, I must like, be broken. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like the the problems with me, not the program. Right. Yeah. That's a. That's really where I was ended up going with that. So I think that's part of our messaging, part of our packaging. It's like, well, people do want options. Like t- they want you to tell them what to do, right? But mm-hmm. the thing needs to be not by design. It needs to be more flexible or malleable to different responses because we know that people are going to respond differently. And if you make it rigid, then you have effectively well, to use a term that we, we throw around a lot is no, you've no SIBO them. You said, look, mm-hmm. man, if you don't respond to this, you're, you're trash. You should, <laughs> yeah. you know, sterilize yourself. You should like, this is your genetics are such that you it's incompatible with life. So consider, you know, the alternative, which is, uh, you know, that's not what we're trying to do instead of we're trying to say, Hey, everyone's welcome here. You can probably get some benefit. We just got to figure out what's the right formulation. What's the right dose. And here are some tools that will help you. But that uh, that doesn't sell. You can't. The Instagram caption like limitations are not long <laughs> enough to allow <laughs> for all of that. You know, uh, what's what's been your general process so far? Like, how many papers, if you had to estimate, have you like pulled? And wh- what's your general sense of the literature on chicks versus dudes? Um. So so as far as where I am in my research, it's still um, waging war against the IRB. Um, <laughs> so so data collection is going to start in January. Um, but in, in terms of my lit review, so, um, what I'm going to be looking at is, um, both fatigability during resistance training and recovery after resistance training. Um, as far as fatigue goes, there are a a metric fuck ton of papers about it, but almost none of them are actually relevant to -to day-to-day lifting. Um, so the, the most common model used to assess fatigue during resistance exercise in, well, in really, really in anything, but in men versus women, um, is isometric exercise. 
So, you know, like an isometric bicep curl or like an isometric knee extension, um, that tends to be used so you can tease out mechanisms a little better. Um, so if you're taking like EMG, you're not going to have like natural fluctuations due to like, you know, different parts of the rep. Um, it should be like relatively stable because it's an isometric contraction and a like relatively small torque band. Um, you know, if you're looking at like oxygenation, that's a lot easier if the muscle is just contracting in place. Um, so yeah, there are good reasons most of the papers use isometric exercise, but um, that's definitely a drawback. Um, because like the, the studies with isometric, isometric exercise show very close to unanimously that women fatigue at a slower rate during resistance exercise than men. Um, with the relative magnitude of, of the benefit for the women getting smaller as loads increase. So women may take three times as long to fatigue at 30% of max force, but may only take 20% longer to fatigue at 90%, for example. Um, but for the handful of studies that have used dynamic exercise, um, they still kind of lean in favor of women fatiguing a little bit slower than men, um, but the results are, are a lot more variable, um, not nearly as clean as isometric stuff. Uh, one of the potential reasons for that, uh, for both of those things, so one, women fatiguing slower, and two, um, the, the well, three things. Two, the advantage getting smaller as loads increase, and three, uh, clear difference with isometric, not as clear of a difference with dynamic, um, is that during exercise, so here's actually like a fun thing to think about. Like why necessarily would you like fatigue with a given load? So like on a 12 rep max, like why can you get rep 12 but can't get rep 13? Um, ultimately, it comes down to mostly just not being able to produce enough ATP to fuel the muscle contraction for the next rep. Um, but it's probably not necessarily going to be limited by um, like ATP replenishment rates. Um, more often than not, it's it's due to um, like metabolite buildup. We used to think that it was hydrogen ions. Now we're thinking it's probably more um, free phosphates in the muscle, um, but that inhibit actin and myosin binding and, and the whole process of muscle contraction. Um, and so one of the things that's very important is being able to clear those wastes out of your muscles. And so women have... Um, slightly better blood flow both into and out of the muscle during uh, muscular contractions than men do. And one of the reasons is that they have smaller muscles. So they're not putting right. as I much... I say, yeah. Yeah. So they're not putting as much occlusive force on their blood vessels. Um, and so during isometric exercise, what you tend to see is like <sighs> up, up until about 80% of the way to failure, um, like kind of biochemically, not much is really changing all that much within the muscle. But then once uh, it gets challenging enough that blood flow starts becoming occluded, then people fatigue very, very quickly and ultimately fail. Um, and so with isometric exercise, women, it takes them considerably longer to reach that point. Um, with dynamic exercise, especially if you're trying to like move every rep as fast as possible, um, it very well could be that men and women are occluding their, their blood flow to similar degrees um, on every rep anyways, just because like, it's going to be more forceful than just an isometric contraction that you're holding at a very submaximal intensity. Um, so yeah. Um, <laughs> the, do you, do you, the, do you the, suspect, the, do you suspect that the, some of those differences would go away once if you were to correct it for lean body mass? So, okay. So three really cool papers. Um, <laughs> so he got, he got so excited. <laughs> yeah. So um, th there are two using isometric isometric exercise um, from ah dang it what's his name Anoka Roger Anoka's lab um, where they actually strength matched the men and women so not just like matched relative strength but like the women were as strong as the men were um, and so one of the studies used continuous isometric contractions and the other one used intermittent isometric contractions. So contract for six seconds and then relax for four seconds. Um, in the first paper, the men and women fatigued at the same rate, which like supports the idea that, oh, if you match them for strength, they occlude blood flow similarly and they fatigue at similar rates. In the paper with uh, intermittent contractions, 
the women still fatigued much, much slower than the men did. Um, potentially because like maybe they, they were getting um, like better blood flow, like during the actual relaxation period. Um, and then more to your point, there was a more recent paper using like isokinetic bicep curls. Um, so like dynamic exercise, but still isokinetic. So, so not exactly what goes on in the gym. Um, where they co-varied for baseline strength. And so before co-varying for strength, um, the women fatigued slower than the men did. But after co-varying for strength, it seemed like they fatigued at pretty similar rates. Um, so one of the things I'm going to do with my thesis is... Um, so, I, so I'm using the bench press. And in an ideal world, I could co-vary based on like some direct measure of muscle size. Um, but like triceps are kind of tricky... Um, front delts are very tricky. And like, since it's men and women, like I'm not going to do ultrasound scans of women's pecs. Like I don't want a lawsuit. Um, I mean, so I'll do it. (laughs) So we're, so we're going to be doing, um, uh, arm lean mass via DEXA. And Mm -hmm. so we're going to see like one, if the women fatigue slower than the men and two, if that goes away after co-varying for arm lean mass. Yeah, cool. That's it's really interesting, and I think the reason Austin asked that. So we actually talk about differences between men and women, both in like training outcomes and how you would, you know, program for them differently just based on gender alone. And you know, mm-hmm. the overwhelming sort of nudge that I've gotten from the research is that when correcting for lean body mass, there's not really a whole lot of difference just based on, but just based on gender alone, rather, there are psychological inputs, there are neural and genetic related factors that are, you know, why, you know, hugely variable across the population in general. Mm-hmm. And so if you took a chick and a dude who were, had the same amount of lean body mass and, you know, similar genetic profiles, you would expect, you know, similar level, similar outcomes. And it, it, and it sounds like that's kind of the state of your research at this point until you go further and have a more direct, you know, example or direct so, testing. So, he, so as far as fatigue goes, um, so that, that, that is how we're going to look at it. So covariant for arm lean mass. But I, I also wonder, I also wonder if, if since muscle mass on average does vary so much, between the sexes, so like men tend to have qu- quite a bit more lean mass than women. I wonder sure. if that will essentially just function as covariant for sex. Yeah, yeah, right, um, right. So it's like, <laughs> so it's like when I draw this. So I, I thought about this thing a while ago after reading. I, it must have been after reading Magnus's book. It you know about training sensitivity, and then I came up with this idea of like an athletic spectrum, and it was like, okay, well, men and women, just based on gender alone, you might not be able to predict, you know where mm-hmm. someone sits on this training sensitivity spectrum and on this athletic spectrum. Rather, if I knew their lean body mass, I would have a bigger predictor of, you know, where, you know, where they're going to sit on that. Mm-hmm. Now, men, sure. If you're going to say that men in general carry more lean body mass than women, then maybe that tail, you know, is shifted one way. And then for females carrying less lean body mass, the, you know, mean is shifted another way. And so then, yeah, it just ends up correcting for itself. But mm-hmm. As far as like initial programming modifications, I my general <clears throat> rule of thumb right now is that I don't necessarily make any just based on the fact if you're a chick or a dude, because yeah. I, I, I don't necessarily expect there to be a huge difference until proven otherwise. And now, the, the the one area, so, so looping back to something earlier in the conversation, the one area where there may actually be like a, a fairly large sex difference is in responses to low load training. Um, so like there's... There's counting both studies on trained and untrained people. There's close to a dozen studies now in men showing similar hypertrophy between high load and low load training. Um, there's only one paper ever that's actually looked at that in women uh, by Schwenke in 2012. Um, and it found like great hypertrophy training with eight rep max loads and like basically none training with 20 rep max loads. Um, so, so like, it showed like a very clear superiority for high load training, um, which hasn't been found in men. And, and so like that, that finding, so it is just one paper. It needs replication, et cetera. Um, but that, that very well could be one area where, where men and women do um, systematically differ, but that that's yeah. also kind of a fringe case. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Like, un- unless yeah. you're just well, going to be programming sets of 30 for your lifters. <laughs> that's Well, that's actually what I do. Yeah, I actually. So I select all BCC, add 30 reps. That's the, that's the <laughs> prescription. Um, you know, so on the similar line of fatigue, uh, your recent article that we read was about the fatiguing the like fatigue rates of middle-aged lifters versus younger lifters. And so Mm -hmm. if you're from the outside world, you would expect, well, of course, older lifters fatigue faster than younger guys. What what did you guys actually find when you went into the literature? Well, this was, Um, this was, this was of a specific paper. This, this, uh, this review is my understanding of it. And we can, we can like link it for the audience, but I think a lot of our audience, there's tons of discussions about, you know, the ways younger and middle-aged and older folks respond to training. And I think this one was pretty interesting mm -hmm. from our perspective. So I was hoping you could kind of, uh, detail it for us a little bit. Yeah. I mean, the, the main thing we found is that there's pretty much no research looking at middle-aged lifters. Um, so like a lot of young, a lot of studies on young people because like you know you're you're doing studies at universities and there's a lot of university age kids to do studies on. Um, a lot of studies on like geriatric people, so people 60, 65 plus, because it's really easy to secure res- well relatively easy to secure research funding to research that population. Um, but people like 35 to 60 years old. There's there's precious little research on that demographic because um, they're they're not as easy easy as young people and not as easy to secure funding for as older people. Um, but yeah, so so in the research out there on middle aged adults, um, which is like a grand total of five papers in, in like a resistance training context, it, it really seems like they just don't differ from young people all that much. Either in rates of, or either in terms of like rates of fatigue, or in terms of how quickly they recover from training. Um. So so like. Wait, so you're saying that being older in and of itself is not like this huge biological difference in how well you recover from training. So I I think that there are like, I think there are kind of like four buckets that you could put people into so like kids like kids don't kids don't get tired uh they don't they don't produce pfk so they never accumulate lactate and they never really wear themselves out um and so like yeah kids don't get tired they don't really get sore like they never fatigue and recover from everything immediately pretty much um then like teenagers they now have pfk they can fatigue themselves they can be sore the next day from training um but they also just have a hormonal how do you pronounce that word is it milieu or milieu <laughs> i think it's french i think i think it's the, I, the I'm second sure pronunciation claude bernard, i'm pretty sure that claude bernard said hor- hormonal milieu but i like milieu better like, I, like i'm pretty i think that's what it is i just feel dumb saying it um <laughs> yeah Anyway, same, they, they same have time. they have a lot of hormones that are conducive to uh, recovering from damn near anything really quickly. Um, so I think that like recovery rates do, you know, drop off between like nine years old and 15 years old. But you still have like a relatively enhanced rate of recovery at that point. Then I think once you hit like once you're out of puberty and hit adulthood, which for individuals could be anywhere between maybe like 17 years old on the low end up to like 23, 24 then I think you're you're basically settled into adulthood at that point. And like you may start going downhill a little bit between 25 and 55. But really you're you're just not that different. Um on average, like as long as you take care of yourself. Like there are some people who are 50 who may as well be 70, but like if someone has been generally active and taking care of themselves, like you're not going to be quite as good off at 50 as you were at 25, but like you're gonna, you know, have some more aches and pains, maybe recover a little slower, fatigue a little faster, but you're just not that that different. Um, and then once like senescence starts kicking in, uh, some generally for most people somewhere in their 60s, then then there is a more precipitous slide. Um, but but for the most part, like, so I think I think middle aged people think that middle age sucks because like they used to be active when they were kids. And then they did absolutely nothing for 20 years. And then they tried to do something again. And they're like, ah, it's not like when I was younger. 
But it's like, yeah, also, you're not like when you were younger. Like, it it didn't suck to exercise when you were 20 because you'd been exercising for 20 consecutive years at that point. Like, if you actually train for six months, you might not actually feel all that different than you did when you were 20. Yeah, I think it's, it's super interesting because, you know, we talk a lot about um, topics, uh, particularly, you know, uh, uh, pain and kind of breaking it down into like the biological contributors and psychological contributors and kind of the social learning aspect of people's pain experience and things like that. And I've uh, recently wrote, uh, wrote something on our, our site pertaining to fatigue and how there's kind of a similar kind of way to approach fatigue in terms of biological mediators of fatigue, but also like, you know, ex- ex- expectancy type effects and like social learning kinds of things. And I think that that probably has an influence on this sort of thing when, you know, you're approaching middle age and, you and your friends are all approaching middle age and everybody's starting to complain about, you know, the fact that they're middle age and there's this like precipitous drop off as soon as you hit 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever arbitrary age it is. And you kind of start to, you know, you you might feel an ache or a pain and you suddenly label it as like, oh, that is there because I'm old now and stuff like that. And so, (laughs) you know, we have to undo a lot of this stuff with our clients when we get middle age folks that we're coaching and they come in and we have to just help them dispose of these ideas and teach them that they're not broken just because they're, you know, some arbitrary, not very old age uh, that, you know, what they've been, what they've been told and what they expect from training is, you know, kind of what they're perceiving. And we have to kind of try to undo that sometimes. And on the other side, they're like, holy cow, like, you know, my life is different now that I don't identify as old and broken. And I identify as Mm -hmm. just a person who can, you know, do this stuff just as well as anybody else. See, I think you're full of it, and you're just a shill for a <laughs> big biopsychosocial model. <laughs> that, is, right. uh, that is yeah. completely accurate. <laughs> the, the, waiting the, for the, that paycheck. The global cabal of corrupt <laughs> researchers pushing yes. forth this bankrupt theory. No, I, I agree. I agree entirely. So, so actually, so one, one, one thing I will add to that is so like when I make statements like this, or I assume when you make statements like this, um, one of the pieces of pushback that I always get is like, well, look at professional athletes. Like, you know, they're at the top of their game when they're like 25, 26. And by the time they're 35, like they're ancient and they're mostly out like retired out of the league, uh, just can't perform at the same level. And so, and I think that's a frame that a lot of people use like, Oh, like look at, I mean, LeBron's still a God, but like, look at most basketball players at, 35 and compare them to when they were 25 and they're just not the same player anymore uh, or like any other sport. So I think there are like some very key differences between you, dear listener, and a professional athlete. One is that <laughs> one is that like professional sports take an insane toll on people's bodies, like practicing and playing all the time. And it varies sport to sport. So like, you know, football is probably going to age you a lot faster than say like middle distance running. But like both, you're putting insane training loads on your body. Like it's it's gonna accelerate the aging process. Two is that like like very small differences could be like the difference between being like incredibly good and just a scrub. Um, and so like you know maybe physiologically people fall off five percent between twenty five and thirty five. Like you or me, like we're probably not really gonna be able to tell. Or if we can, it's like oh that's slightly annoying, but I can still basically do everything I used to. But if you're a 5% worse, like baseball player, like if, if your uh, reaction time gets 5% slower, maybe you go from hitting 40 home runs to not being able to hit the ball at all. Um, and then also like some of the things that do change uh, a bit more with aging, um, like a bit faster than just endurance, so like VO2 max or muscular strength or muscle size um, are things like reaction time and eyesight. So like in a lot of sports, having better than 2020 vision is almost a prerequisite for being able to compete at a high level. Um, And there are, yeah, and like there are a lot of people below 25 with like 2010 vision. There aren't that many people at 35 with better than 2020 vision. Um, And then like, again, like reaction times, like, you know, a 10th of a second, well, it doesn't drop that much. Like a 20th of a second, like... (laughs) You're, you're not going to be able to tell the difference of like a 20th of a second reaction time when you're bench pressing. But if you're like playing tennis and it's a 20th of a second slower, like identifying where a serve's going, like, you know, you can go from being good to terrible. Um, so, yeah, like there's there there the, the things that go downhill physiologically 
quick. Uh, some of them like affect pro athletes in a big way, especially in like, you know, field sports um, that like you're just not going to notice in the gym and things like, you know, uh, anaerobic conditioning, aerobic conditioning, like look at look at uh, like marathon times, like different age bracket marathon times. Um, you know, people tend to hit their peak somewhere in their 30s, but like there are still people running sub 215 marathons in like their 50s. Um and like by seven, by like 70, 80, like it really starts dropping off. But, um, and like same thing with powerlifting. Um, like most guys have, have kind of broken themselves by their forties or fifties, but like the guys who've stayed healthy, like Dave Ricks, like he's, he's as strong as he's ever been. Um, but, but yeah, like, like muscle strength, uh, sheer aerobic endurance, like those things, they just don't drop off that quickly with aging. Well, that is the physiology lesson for the day. Also, the biological aging lesson for the day. So let this be a lesson that just because you're old chronologically does not necessarily mean that you're a different human, uh, especially that, that you can predict, you know, oh, you're so old, then you're going to do terrible with this particular program. I, again, this is a similar theme. I, I, I am assuming the null until proven otherwise. Uh, Greg, I just want to thank you for coming on our podcast and not being adversarial. Not that I expected you to be, but you know, that was some time ago. And, uh, I think this is going to be super useful for folks. Uh, can you tell people where to find you on the internets? You can plug whatever you like. Sure. Um, so to start with the plug, if it sounds like I know things about science and you'd like to check out my research review that I put out every month with Eric Helms and Mike Zordos. Uh, it's called Mass Monthly Applications in Strength Sport. Um, and you can find that at strongerbyscience.com slash mass. Um, most of my just general free content is written and it's at strongerbyscience.com. Um, and then in terms of social media, I'm most active on Facebook and, and somewhat on Instagram. And those are just my name. Greg, not Greg Knuckles the Kid. That is a different person that we try to Skype with. It's not you. You, you <laughs> accidentally actually added him to the call. He was probably very confused. <laughs> that, that is not me. Yeah. Uh, for everyone out there in the internet land, please leave us a review on iTunes so we can uh, fight the good fight against BS on the webs. Leave us a like on YouTube. Subscribe for the latest content. We'll catch you guys next time. All right. See you guys later.